Hello, this is Morel Bernard with a story, the life story of Booker T. Washington, the American, the advisor to USA presidents. And by the way, please subscribe and please share. I believe the last words said was something to do with not a single picture of a farm scene, a spreading apple tree, a field of grass or corn, a flock of sheep or a herd of cows. The preliminary investigation of certain phases of the life of the people of my race led me to make a more thorough study of their needs in order that I might have more light on the problem of what the Tuskegee Institute could do to help them. Before beginning work at Tuskegee, I had felt that too often in educational missionary effort, the temptation was to try to force each individual into a certain mould, regardless of the condition that needs of the subject or of the ends sought. It seemed to me a mistake to try to fit people for conditions which may have been successful in communities a thousand miles away or in times centuries remote, without paying attention to the actual life and needs of those living in the shadow of the institution and for whom its educational machinery must labour. In the beginning of my work, when I thought it was necessary to investigate at close range the history and environment of the people around us, it soon became evident that this data was a valuable basis for the undertaking at Tuskegee. For it was demonstrated that we were about to take a share and the burden of educating a race which had had little or no need for labour in its native land before being brought to America, a race which had never known voluntary incentives to toil. The tropical climate had been generous to the inhabitant of Africa and had supplied him without effort with a few things needful for the support of the body. I had caused to recall the story of a native who went to sleep on his back in the morning under a banana tree with his mouth open, confident that before noon a providential banana would fall into his mouth. While the African had little occasion to work with his hands in the land of his nativity, by the end of his period of slavery in this country, he had undergone 200 and 50 years of the severest labour. Therefore, many friends of the race argue that the American Negro, of all people, ought to be released from further hand training, especially while in school. Others said that the Negro had been worked for centuries, and now that the race was free, there ought to be a change. At Tuskegee, we replied that it was true that the race had been worked in slavery, but the great lesson which the race needed to learn in freedom was to work. We said that as a slave, the Negro was worked. As a free man, he must learn to work. There is a vast difference between working and being worked. Being worked means degradation. Working means civilization. This was the difference which our institution wished chiefly to emphasize. We argue that during the days of slavery, labor was forced out of the Negro, and he had acquired for this reason a dislike for work. The whole machinery of slavery was not apt to beget the spirit of love, of labour. Because these things were true, we promised to try to teach our students to lift labour out of drudgery and to place it on a plane where it would become attractive and where it would be something to be sought rather than something to be dreaded and, if possibly, avoided. More than this, 
we wanted to teach men and women to put brains into the labour of the hand and to show that it was possible for one with the best mental training to work with the hands without feeling that he was degraded. While we were considering our plans at Tuskegee, many persons argued with me, as they had done with General Armstrong years before at Hampton, that all the Negro youth needed as education was mental and religious training, and that all else would follow of itself. Partly in answer to this argument, we pointed to our people in the Republic of Haiti, who were freed many years before emancipation came to our race in the southern states. A large number of the leading citizens of Haiti during the long period of years had been given a most thorough mental training, not only in Haiti but also in France, and the Catholic Church had surrounded the population from birth with religious influences. Many Haitians had distinguished themselves in the study of philosophy and the languages, and yet the sad fact remained that Haiti did not prosper. I wish to be entirely fair to the Haitians. Haiti exports annually from 60 to 80 million pounds of coffee and several hundred million pounds of precious woods. A French statistician says that among the 60 countries of the globe which carry on regular commerce with France, Haiti figures in the 17th place. In amount of special duties received at the French Custom House upon the products imported from those 60 countries, Haiti comes in the fourth rank. It seems well to observe, then, that here, in the foundation for the upbuilding of a rich and powerful country with great natural resources, it seems all the more inexcusable that industrial conditions should be as unsatisfactory as they are. The thoughtful and progressive men in the republics of Haiti and Santo Domingo now recognise the fact that while there has always been a demand for professional men and women of the highest type of scholarship, at the same time, many of these scholars should have had such scientific and industrial education as would have brought them into direct contact with the development of the material resources of the country. They now see that their country would have been advanced far beyond its present condition, materially and morally, if a large proportion of the brightest youths had been given skills handicrafts, and had been taught the mechanical arts and practical methods of agriculture. Some of them should have been educated as civil, mining, sanitary engineers, and others as architects and builders. And most important of all, agriculture should have been scientifically developed. If such a foundation had been laid, it is probable that Haiti would now possess good public roads, streets, bridges and railroads, and that its agricultural and mining resources would have made the country rich, prosperous and contented. It is a deplorable fact that one of the richest islands in natural resources in the world is compelled to import a large proportion of its food and clothing. It is actually true that many of the people of Haiti, some of them graduates of the best universities of France, contend themselves with wearing clothes imported from Europe. It is also true that great quantities of canned meats and vegetables are brought from the United States, 
commodities which could easily be produced at their very doors. The Haitians claim, however, that most of the imported food is for the use of foreigners, as they themselves eat very little meat that is not freshly cooked. The people live almost wholly upon the primitive products of undisturbed nature, and the greater part of the harvesters and other workers are women. I have been told, upon reliable authority, that the majority of the educated persons in the island take up the professions, and that because there is almost no industrial development of the country, the lawyer naturally finds himself without clients, and he, in common with others of the educated classes, spends much of his time in writing poetry in discussing subjects in abstract science or embroiling his country in revolutions. In recent years, I have received most urgent appeals from both Haiti and Santo Domingo for advice and assistance in the direction of educating industrial and scientific leaders. The best friends of Haiti and Santo Domingo now realize that tremendous mistakes have been made. They see that if the people had been taught in the beginning of their freedom that all forms of idleness were disgraceful and that all forms of labor, whether with the head or with the hand, were honorable, the country today would not be in such stress or poverty they would have fewer revolutions because the people would have industries to occupy their time, their thoughts and their energies. I ought to add that in such deficiencies as these, Haiti is perhaps not worse off than some South American republics which have made the same mistakes. The situation in these countries which have overlooked the value of industrial training remind me of a story told by the late Henry W. Grady about a country funeral in Georgia. The grave was dug in the midst of a pine forest, but the pine coffin that held the body was brought from Cincinnati. Hickory and other hard woods grew in abundance nearby. But the wagon on which the coffin was drawn came from South Bend, Indiana. And the mule that drew the wagon came from Missouri. Valuable minerals were close to the cemetery, but the shovels and picks used in digging the grave came from Pittsburgh, and their handles from Baltimore. The shoes in which the dead man was buried came from Lynn, Massachusetts, his coat and trousers from New York, his shirt from Lowell, Massachusetts, and his collar and tie from Philadelphia. The only things supplied by the county with its wealth of natural resources was the corpse and the hole in the ground. And Mr. Grady added that the county probably would have imported both of these if it could have done so. When any people, regardless of race or geographical location, have not been trained to habits of industry, have not been given skill of hand in youth, and taught to love labour, a direct result is a breeding of a worthless, idle class which spends a great deal of its time in trying to live by its wits. If a community has been educated exclusively on books and has not been trained in habits of applied industry, an unwholesome tendency to dodge honest, productive labour is likely to develop as in the case of Haiti. 
people acquire a fatal fondness for wasting valuable hours in discussing politics and conspiring to overthrow the government. I have noted too that when the people of a community have not been taught to work intelligently with their hands or have not learned habits of thrift and industry, they are likely to be fretting continually for fear that no one will be left to earn a living for them. There are few more dismal and discouraging sights than the men of a community absorbed in idle gossip and political discussion. I have seen more than a dozen white men in one small town take their seats under a tree or on the shady side of the street as early as eight o'clock in the morning and talk politics until noon. Then they would go home for dinner and return at one o'clock to spend the remainder of the day threshing out the same threadbare topics. Their greatest exertion during the whole long day would be in moving from the sunny side of the street or tree to the shady side and back again. A curious trait of such parasites is that they are always wondering why times are hard and why there is so little money in circulation in their communities. An argument handed down from Reconstruction times was once urged by many people, both white and coloured, against industrial education. It was to the effect that because the white South had from the first opposed what is popularly called higher education for the Negro, this must be the only kind good for him. I remember that When I was trying to establish the Tuskegee Institute, nearly all the white people who talked with me on the subject took it for granted that instruction in Greek, Latin and modern languages would be main features in our curriculum. And I heard no one oppose what it was thought our course of study would embrace. In fact, There are many white people in the South at the present time who do not know that the dead languages are not taught at Tuskegee. Further proof of what I have said will be furnished by the catalogues of the schools maintained by the Southern states for Negro people and managed by Southern white people. It will be found that in almost every instance, instruction in the higher branches is given with the consent and approval of white officials. This was true as far back as 1880. It is not unusual to meet even at this time southern white people who are as emphatic in their belief in the value of of classical education as a certain element of the coloured people themselves. But the bulk of opinion in the South had little faith in the efficiency of the higher or any other kind of education for the Negro. They were indifferent, but did not openly oppose. Not all have been indifferent, however, for there has always been a potent element of white people in all the southern states who have stood up openly and bravely for the education of all the people, regardless of race. This element has had considerable success thus far in shaping and leading public opinion and I believe it will become more and more influential. This does not mean that there is as yet an equitable division of the school funds raised by common taxation. Why not? Join me. Find out more. Join me in the next video. Join me in the next video of the life, the real life story of Booker. T. Washington.
a real life story, Booker T. Washington. Join me in the next video. And please subscribe and please share. Join me in the next video. I'll see you there. Morale. Bye-bye.